Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Walter Jost. I'm a professor in the English department and the current uh, chair of the Paige Barber and Richard Lectures Series Committee. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you here today. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand the mic over to Professor uh, John Haight from the Psychology Department, who will be introducing our uh, esteemed, our very eminent guest this afternoon. Uh, but first, it's customary for the chair of the committee to say a few words about this uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm going to do that in just a moment. But first, I wanted to publicly thank uh, John Haight and our um, assistant, our Paige Barber assistant, I'm not sure, there, uh, there she is, Christina Michalski, a graduate student in philosophy, uh, both of whom have done just uh, a, a great labor of love to make this work and make things as pleasant as possible for Professor Appia and, and all of us. Um, and speaking of pleasure, before I forget, uh, we're going to have nice, wholesome, uh, and more importantly, good, well, I don't know how wholesome it is, but it's good food and drink uh, in the lobby. If, you, if you've been here before, you know how, how well we serve uh, and how we do it right. So uh, you're um, encouraged to join us afterwards, not only after this lecture, but uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday at the same time and place. So very briefly then, just a few words about these lecture series. Uh, the Page Barber lectures of which professors Professor Appias will uh, belong, were founded in 1907 by Mrs. Thomas Nelson Page. The lectures, which may be in any field in the arts and sciences, were intended for, to present, quote, some fresh aspect or aspects of the Department of Thought, end quote, in which the lecturer is a specialist. And for us, that, that really means uh, cutting edge work of the, of the highest quality in the field that our, the speaker um, comes from. Past page Barber lecturers have included um, President and Chief Justice William Howard Taft. You see that these lectures do go back. Um, the very eminent poets, T.S. Eliot and W.H. Auden. Um, some of you have at least read the Eliot lectures. I don't know if anybody was in attendance back then. Uh, I have here, I think from our website, it says, the philosophers, Walter Lippmann and John Dewey, but that does, that's not right. Um, philosopher John Dewey, Walter Lippmann was not quite, I don't think that's quite right. That might be my, my bias. And then also the psychologists B.F. Skinner and Robert Coles, among many others. Recent page Barber lectures have included philosophers Richard Rorty, the physicist Freeman Dyson, and art historian T.J. Clark. The closely related le uh, Richard's lectures which focus on topics in religion and or history, were initiated in 1923 and have featured such notable features, uh, figures as Paul Tillich, Yaroslav Pelikan, Jakob Neusner, Paul Ricoeur, and more recently, the philosopher Quentin Skinner. This is a very distinguished group, of course, and I am confident, as you are, that Professor Appiah will fit in quite nicely. So uh, allow me first to then um, put the, bring the mic over to Professor Haight, who will introduce our guest. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, Professor uh, Anthony Appiah uh, was born in London and raised uh, mostly in Ghana, but also with summers and some schooling uh, back in England. Um, we psychologists no longer believe that a person's parents uh, determine their personality or their destiny. Uh, however, in Professor Appiah's case, in his own writings, he attributes uh, much of his ability to think in the way that he does and to have done the work that he does uh, to the influence of his, of his parents. His father, Joseph, uh, was a lawyer from an influential family in Ghana, uh, and he was active in the independence movement uh, of Ghana from Britain. Um, in, uh, in Appiah's book, Cosmopolitanism, Appiah tells us that his father's last message to him and his sisters was, quote, uh, remember, you are citizens of the world. Joseph Appiah met Peggy Cripps when he was studying uh, law in London. Peggy was also from a politically uh, active and very influential family uh, in England, and uh, she later became a writer and uh, uh, an activist in Ghana. Uh, the dedication that Appiah chose for cosmopolitanism was this, quote, for my mother, 
citizen of one world and many. In part because of these extraordinary parents, Appiah too became a citizen of many worlds, political, cultural, and academic. <clears throat> um, Appiah is one of the world's deepest thinkers on how members of these many worlds can coexist, construct identities, and even thrive in each other's presence. Appiah earned his bachelor's degree and PhD in philosophy from Cambridge. Uh, he then became the center of a constant tug of war between the top American universities, uh, including uh, he, was teaching, he taught at Yale, Cornell, Duke, and Harvard in departments of philosophy and Afro-American studies. Princeton finally won the tug of war, and in 2002, he was appointed the Lawrence S. Rockefeller uh, university professor with appointments, joint appointments in the departments of philosophy and the University Center for Human Values. That's where I met him in uh, 2006 um, when I, I spent a year there at the center as a visiting professor. Uh, during that year, I discovered that Professor Appiah is just as elegant and gracious in person as the man that you imagine when you read his prose. Professor Appy has written 13 books and edited 19 more. Uh, these books cover an extraordinary range. The largest group of them pertain to uh, African uh, and African-American literature and history. Uh, but he also has uh, in there uh, several straight-ahead uh, straight books of uh, analytical, uh, analytic philosophy, uh, books on the foundations of liberalism, culture and identity, and three detective stories. Um, he's also written over 100 essays and dozens of book reviews, uh, many published in the New York Review of Books and the New York Times. <clears throat> uh, for this extraordinary combination of productivity, creativity, and relevance to real world problems, he's been honored, uh, well, he's been honored with honorary degrees uh, from seven universities, uh, and he has received quite a few book awards or best book selections from groups as diverse as the American Political Science Association, the Council on Foreign Relations, the New York Times, and Amazon.com. In all of his work, he reveals an uncanny ability to integrate multiple perspectives. That's why I began this introduction with those comments about his parents and what he uh, himself thinks uh, of, of, his, of his parents' influence. As Appiah says in his book, The Ethics of Identity, quote, if there is something distinctive in my approach, it is that I start always from the perspective of the individual engaged in making his or her life, recognizing that others are engaged in the same project, and concerned to ask what social and political life means for this ethical project we share. In Cosmopolitanism, he writes, quote, I am urging that we should learn about people in other places, take an interest in their civilizations, their arguments, their errors, their achievements, not because that will bring us to agreement, but because it will help us to get used to one another. And in his most recent book, Experiments in Ethics, he reviews the latest work in moral psychology, constantly moving back and forth between, between two perspectives, uh, that of the psychologist and the philosopher. He says about these two perspectives, quote, one is that of a sort of cosmic engineer crafting our natures. That's obviously the psychologist. Um, the other is that of the moral agent thus crafted. And only a misguided monism would force both perspectives into one. In his three-page Barber lectures this week, uh, Appy will bring his, perspe his perspective-taking abilities to bear on questions of honor and moral change. He'll help us to take the perspective of those who looked at honor practices such as dueling and footbinding as things essential to their honor, and he'll, he'll help us to take the perspective of those who came to see such practices as absurd. He'll also explain how it is that people in those same nations could switch perspectives over the course of just a few decades. <laughs> I think his lectures are going to have a special resonance with us here at the University of Virginia um, because our honor code and single sanction, which made sense within the small, tight-knit, and aristocratic culture of 19th century Virginia, has come to seem absurd to many members uh, of our large, diverse, and modern community of trust. Or if not absurd, then at least the single sanction has come to seem so unjust that hardly any of us are willing to file honor charges. Our commitment to an honor practice without an understanding of the moral change that's happened over the last hundred years has condemned us to the widespread toleration of dishonor. That at least is my perspective as a social and moral psychologist. Uh, the students here may have many other perspectives. But let us now hear the perspectives of Professor Anthony Appiah in these three lectures on honor and moral change. Today's lecture is The Dual Dies. We are honored and thrilled to have you here with us today. 